In this tutorial, we'll learn how to use an Arrhenius plot to determine kinetic parameters. The question reads, the decomposition of ozone is important to many atmospheric reactions. Take a look. Ozone breaks down into diatomic oxygen and a molecule of oxygen. A study of the kinetics of the reaction resulted in the following data. We have an independent and dependent variable. The independent variable is the temperature in Kelvin, and the dependent variable is the rate constant. Look at the units of the rate constant. They are in molars raised to the power of negative one times seconds raised to the power of negative one. In other words, one over m times s. That's an indication that this is a second order reaction because first order reactions are one over s. We have to determine the value of the frequency factor and the activation energy for the reaction. Those are the two parameters we're concerned about here. To do this problem effectively, we have to prepare a graph of the natural log of the rate constant versus the inverse of the temperature. In other words, we'll take the inverse of each of these numbers, take for example 600, it will become 1 over 600, and you record that number rather than 600. And 1 over 600, just to give you an idea, is 0 decimal 0, 0, 1, 6 repeating. So you do this for each of these numbers, but for the rate constant, you'll take the ln of those numbers. So you ln each of these, and you use the function on your calculator. For example, ln of 3.37 times 10 raised to the power of 3. So rather than using 3.37 times 10 to the power of 3, you use 8.1226, for example. Once you've done that, you should actually end up with a linear equation, which is what you would expect for an Arrhenius plot. This is what your plot should look like if you do it correctly. Now on your screen is a graphical representation of the data above. Notice that along the vertical axis we have ln of the constant, which I've represented by the letter k. And along the horizontal axis, this one, we have 1 over the temperature in Kelvin. In addition to that, we also have the slope calculated. And if you record this on Excel, you can easily find this by adding a trend and inserting an equation. You would end up with negative 1.12 times 10 to the power of negative 4. That particular part is your slope. And 26.8 would be your y-intercept. So if we were to hypothetically extend this line where it touches the vertical axis, it would actually cross at 26.8. There's a reason why this information is important. From here, we can calculate the activation energy from the slope by setting the slope equal to negative E over R and solving for the activation energy. And in case you forgot, R represents the gas constant 8.314. Let's go ahead and write all this down. The slope, which is obtained from this equation, is equal to negative E sub A, our activation energy, over R. We'll substitute this with negative 1.12 times 10 to the power of 4 is equal to what we're looking for over 8.314. We need to isolate for this variable, and we can do that by multiplying both sides by this number. And let's go ahead and do that. 8.314 times negative 1.12 times 10 to the power of 4. We end up with negative 93116, and we divide both sides by negative to get rid of the negative in front of E. And that gives us the positive version of this number. We need this to three significant figures, so I'll simply write down 9.31 times 10 to the power of 4. And the units here, be careful, because the units here were joules per moles times k, Kelvin. And the units here were Kelvin, so the k units canceled out after we multiplied the two numbers, leaving us with joules per mole. Now to calculate the frequency factor, we use the y-intercept, and we make it equal to ln of a. So we'll call the frequency factor a, and I'll set ln of the frequency factor is equal to the y-intercept, 26.8. All we have to do is solve for a, and we can do that by raising both sides as bases to e. So we have Euler's number, e, 26.8, and that gives us the frequency factor of 4.3 to three significant figures would be 4.36 times 10 to the power of 11. 
let me write that down, 4.36 times 10 to the power of 11. And the units would be the exact same as the constant, which is one over moles times seconds. In part B, they ask, use the results of the Arrhenius analysis to predict the rate constant at 298 Kelvin. So this time, they want us to take 298 Kelvin, the temperature, and substitute it into there. But I can't just substitute 298, I need to reciprocate it. So I have one over 298, then I substitute this number into x. Let's go ahead and do that. We have negative 1.12 times 10 to the power of 4. And that's being multiplied to 1 over 298 plus 26.8. That gives us negative 10.78. Negative 10.8, and that is your y coordinate. Now remember our y coordinate is ln k. So at some point, we had our constant, and we took the natural log of that constant, and we ended up with negative 10.8. Now to reverse this process, we raise both sides to the base e. That cancels out the ln. And now using our calculator, we can find out what it is, negative 10.8. And we end up with 2.8. 0 to 3 significant figures, 4. 2.04 times 10 to the power of negative 5. And the units should be 1 over moles times seconds. Let's see if that's consistent with some of the other results that we found. The smallest temperature we had was 600, and it was 3.37. And as you can tell, as the temperatures increased, the rate constant increased. You can assume that as the temperature gets colder, decreases, this number would get smaller. So we can assume that given how small this number is, it actually fits the trend. And with that being said, that is how to use the Arrhenius plot to determine kinetic parameters.